Uh, with me today is Kevin Driscoll. He's the assistant professor in the Department of Media Studies at the University of Virginia. And he's also co-authored a book, Minitel, Welcome to the Internet with Julian Mayland. I hope I said that right. Yeah. Is that right, Kevin? Yes. Yeah. And, and hot off, the, well, for me anyway, here down in the, the, the deepest depths of the world, New Zealand, uh, I have hot off the press your latest yeah. book, which which you so authored, and it's called The Modem World. And uh, this this particular book, as soon as I found out about it, I found out about it on Twitter, actually. It enthralled me immediately. It just said BBSs. <laughs> and that, that, is, that is a topic for me, which obviously you know, and I know that it, it floats my boat, right? So obviously having uh, done the, um, the, the series uh, Back to the BBS, which some of you uh, watching this video today may have seen um you'll know that it's all about bulletin boards which is you know a you know, sort of i guess how would you how would you describe kevin a bulletin board for the uneducated what what is what what i mean i think that, that's something that i've covered a lot on my channel but for the uneducated let's let's just let's go back to square one what is a bulletin board yeah i mean i think it's helpful that to remember that it is a metaphor for something that exists outside of the world of computers and data networks. And that mm. the bulletin board is just that like very familiar place that you put post up messages that can be in the foyer of a school or a store or outside a university and you put yeah. notes. Because yeah, like, they were they were like made of cork, right? Like physical cork boards board with pins. made of yep. yeah, pins, lost, all that sort of stuff. I lost my dog. I have <laughs> I'm looking for a roommate. There's gonna be a show this weekend just this kind of announcements and so the earliest bulletin board systems that are that we're thinking of as of bbs's are computerized bulletin boards it's literally like let's take that cork and pins board and build it out onto a computer system and we'll attach it to some kind of communication medium and make it accessible to our community to strangers to various publics and the what kind of emerges as the archetypal BBS is a computer that's attached to a phone line by a modem, and it's just hanging out there waiting for incoming calls. And by and large, it's one person at a time taking turns to read the messages that have been posted or leave a message of their own. And from that like very simple system, a lot of complex kinds of networks and social phenomena and all kinds of things can grow. But at its core, it's about creating a small public space that's accessible to a wide group of people to leave messages for one another. Yeah, right. So, I mean, it was created by um, two guys, um, Ward Christensen and Randy Seuss, I think, uh, in the uh, the late 70s, 1978, in Chicago. And I think that the, what happened there was, uh, you know, was the, they had a they had a club right a computer club of sort or something like that and uh, they got snowed in one winter right it was hellish yeah. weather it was a really yeah. really bad snowing and and so rather than do nothing because that was the alternative they couldn't get out of the out in the cars they couldn't go shopping they couldn't do anything so it was literally right we could phone each other and talk or we could do this little project and this project they you know they pulled together some pretty off the shelf kind of components, nothing too esoteric, even by 1978 standards, although, you know, home computing wasn't, it was still in its infancy then, right? But they, they took yeah. all these components pretty much off the shelf and and then had this decision to, you know, and you go on about this in your book, you, you talk about that, even the evolutionary days of what was the bulletin board. They, you know, Randy and Ward decided to put together these components. I think they were actually, they were remote, weren't they? They weren't, they weren't in the same building or anything. They were no, they were not. No. parts of the town, yeah. I think, of Chicago. And so they were on the phone, I presume, or whatever, exchanging letters. I don't, I don't know. And so they do, they were used to having a probably a bulletin board, a physical cork thing at their computer club, wherever the computer club was. And and they just had this leap, this evolutionary thought. Okay, well, why don't we do this digitally? This home computing technology is just here uh you know it's the popular electronics magazine of 1975 you know th that sort of stuff was it was just coming around the corner so by 1978 it was almost readily available enough that people were starting to have these things and then the Hayes modem came out 
and it was just at that sort of time when you know that all the technology came together and you know if those two guys hadn't created it then i guess that somebody else would have eventually right so it was a sure it was a, sure it was a, i mean it was I a matter they, of time they, they're pretty humble about how they talk about it side note i don't know if you could tell the lights are flickering on and off of my house because of the thunderstorm so if i vanish it's because <laughs> of that I just so, thought that was part of the atmosphere, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, it's not special effects, special effects to dramatize the history of the, the snowstorms of the <laughs> of the seventies. Yeah. You know, it's a funny thing about that. So, like, I grew up in North in the Northeast U.S., and the blizzard of seventy eight is like a legendary storm that knocked out like people's um, electricity and stranded people on highways all over the country. And, and so like when I was a kid, my dad told stories about having to like stay at the home of a stranger and get leave his car and walk and stuff like that. And so I expected that that was the blizzard that socked in Ward and Randy, but actually the blizzard that kept them home to build CBBS was a few weeks before. And so if you look at the newspapers for that week, it's like the worst storm just hit Chicago in the Midwest. And it's like, from retrospectively, you can be like, you all didn't even know there's an even bigger one coming. <laughs> <laughs> so that whole winter, people are getting covered with snow. So it was yeah. like there was one storm that kind of kicked off the project where they they talk about calling each other on the phone and being like, hey, let's do this. But then you can imagine that like week after week, the project is running and it required people to call in. And if you look in the pages of Byte magazine over that year, you can see updates on the project. Like they send in a note to announce that it's there and invite readers to call in. And then there's an update a few months later. And then and the, toward the end of the year, there's a special issue on telecommunications, which is mostly about satellites and ham radio, but has one article that's about the computerized BBS. And it documents the first you know, 10 months or so of that bulletin board. Not, yeah, exactly. That Not only right about... Uh, you know, how to run it technologically, but a little bit about the social side of it too. And they mentioned getting the first uh, commercially available modem aimed at the hobbyist market, which was Hayes' first product. And it still required some tinkering around the edges to make the computer be able to wake up and reboot itself in order to answer the phone for each caller. And there's a lot of funny documentation around it because it's a very friendly, familiar system that couldn't be more different from the way we experience large scale commercial social media. Like it kind of implies that there's a good chance it will crash when you call. And like, if it does crash, they've left their home phone numbers. And it says like Ward and his number and Randy and his number. If you're having trouble, you can just give them a call. Maybe they'll be home and they'll talk you through it over the phone. So there's this really kind of like interesting familiarity that is there present in the beginning which reflects a pre-existing culture of computer hobbyists and, and really electronic enthusiasts, which is not only computers, but people building hi-fi systems and tinkering with ham radio and, and lots of other communication-oriented technology hobbies that were prevalent at the time. Yeah, uh, it's it's fun, fantastic that, you know, um, I guess in these sort of moments of adversity or you know, the snowstorm being that adversity at the time, you know, the the hobbyists and the and the curious get together and and make something happen. And I almost yeah. um, I almost put some parallels to a recent, um, you know, COVID situation where, you know, I, I, for example, got back into bulletin boards after a hiatus of probably 20 years. And mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people have been doing that. They've been seeking out new pet projects, whatever they may be, on the internet, on, on social media, on on bulletin boards, right? Whatever they may be. But um, it's really it's really great to see the the enterprise and capabilities of people who basically said, "Well, here's normal life. It's stopped now. We have to do something else. What can we do to sort of stop our boredom? Because these people are, you know, tinkerers. These people are, are you know, they're not they're not people who can just sit and um, vegetate in front of the television, right? Yeah. Another part of it I think is super interesting about the CBBS origin story and lots of other of the club-oriented systems is that the clubs were already making a lot of stuff. So most of the clubs had a newsletter. Like you said, they maybe have a bulletin board up in wherever the room they had their meetings in. 
And so people were writing articles to each other and there was so little information about microcomputing at the time. And lots of things were hard to make, like most of what your computer was, was built from kits. So you really needed to be in touch with other computer enthusiasts to even get your machine up and running. So part of what the bulletin board systems did was it made it possible for you to be in touch with the club on the other days of the month that you weren't meeting. So it wasn't like we're going to meet once a month and then I have to wait till next month to get my question answered. I can post up on the bulletin board, hey, I'm stuck. This is what's going on. Can anybody help me? And then there's also an archive of people's questions from the past. And those two things are things that we take for granted today that if you have a question, particularly like a technological question, you'd be able to go and search and like find traces of people who had similar problems in the past. And that was really scratching an itch for lots of people who were out there alone trying to build computers with their soldering irons and mm -hmm. without Google, without someone else to chat with. Um, so I think about that a lot as like these people were already writing letters to magazines and creating newsletters and things like that. And then the bulletin board became a place to like take that from periodic interactions to more of like a continuous ongoing discourse that could take place. The other part I wanted to mention about it is most people didn't own modems then. Even if you happen to have a computer, which was extremely rare, most people didn't have modems. So when we imagine the early bulletin boards, a really large number of people accessing them were doing so on teleprinter equipment that was appropriated from some other purpose. They might have been into ready, like which is a ham radio mode. So they had the teleprinter, which is just like a paper and ink typewriter with a modem attached to it. And they dial into CBBS on that. So they're not even using a computer to participate in this computer network. Yeah. So there's just so much of all of the things that we have today that we just take for granted. But these, you know, there were other corporate networks out there. There were other ways of sharing information electronically. And you go into that in your book. So I won't um I don't want to put any spoilers out, but basically there was all of these ways. <laughs> <can't spoil> the <laughs> book. <laughs> but but the thing is there was just so many different ways of doing it, but it was the, I guess there was something organic, something very friendly and something personable about this bulletin board concept that was started with CBBS that became so prevalent. Um, do you have any idea why that might have been the case? Why all of a sudden did this sort of meteorite just take just take flight? Why, why, why was it the bulletin board specifically became such a popular platform for uh, for for all over the world for people to use? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's one that gets answered time and again in different contexts. And the way I thought about it is we you kind of approach the computer. If you look for advertising around computers and computer systems, they tend to focus on data or information processing or applications. Like you're going to get this computer and you're going to do something with your personal finances or you're going to like organize your business differently. But in practice, a lot of us use computers mainly to talk to other people or to share information or to do these kinds of community-oriented social activities. And so especially for folks who are coming up through ham radio or CB radio or other kinds of communication-oriented hobbies, they could see the computer as a potential communication device. And you know, another like little historical anecdote that illustrates this is it really wasn't until the mid 1990s that if you bought a computer, it would have communication hardware by default. But for the, most of the, oh, those early years of home computing, the computer didn't come with a modem. It certainly didn't have Ethernet card or anything like that. Those were all extras. And they weren't even like the first thing on most people's shopping lists, which just goes to show that the use of the computer as a communication device was something that emerged. Like, we collectively discover that over and over and over. And I think the bulletin board system enthusiasts, especially folks in the early 80s, were some of the first who had this maybe epiphany of like, oh, this could be a medium for information sharing, for building like community infrastructure, um, for building platforms for this kind of social engagement. So in the beginning, some of that is like, you do it because you can. And there's a real joy and like technical mastery and achievement. 
But part of it is also that it's really accessible. So by like 1983, there's a few how-to books out there about how to make bulletin boards where the full source code is in written in basic and it fits on a few typewritten pages. So it's a challenging program, but not one that's like beyond the capabilities of an individual self-taught programmer. So for a lot of people building bulletin boards, it's like, you know, a kind of project that you would set out for yourself and then you get to show it off and share it with other people and keep it going. So there's a little bit of like the tinkering spirit that goes into it, similar to other men's hobbies, like um, maintaining vintage cars or something like that, where it's like, you know, this is challenging and you do it because it's challenging. I think there's a second generation that comes along around the mid 1980s and after where folks have a specific social need. They need access to a independent media system or they need a place to gather because they're excluded from other spaces. And the bulletin board system technology is there. And so then they can take it and use it to build a system. And the technology part then is like, takes a backseat to the community. Yeah, part. That, that was actually going to be my next point. It's like, yeah, it be, begat, uh, a, you know, a nerd's, platform right it was it was it was mainly geeks and hobbyists electrical engineers and you know the early computer pioneers but very quickly the bulletin board and uh you know the upcoming other sort of i don't know what i'd call them social platforms that you know CompuServe, i'm thinking things like that mm -hmm. right the um and and later the well um but but those platforms um those were created very much not not necessarily with the geek in mind. They were the everybody platform and the bulletin board, certainly whilst it had its underpinnings in this, you know, nerds, nerd central, you know, you had to be, you know, you had to have a big beard and you had to be male and you had to have sandals. It evolved out of that. And, you know, and, and by the, you know, like you say, the mid eighties, there was a whole host of people on there. There was, there were people, um, you know, it was men and women and, you know, all sorts of, you know, people with different interests and, and, and you know it really was a melting pot of um, social activity and and that was something a true evolution um in in computing which you know the communications aspect of of this and the social aspect of it really started to bring an audience to computing that really hadn't been seen before and then we look at the internet we see micq and uh, irc and all those things that came later we you know we can see those as a sort of evolution of those but the the the, the social roots had already taken shape um as a, a very inclusionary um space way back in and you know like even the early to mid 80s and that was yeah. all that was predating the internet really yeah, you can almost think of it as like, there's a way to look at bulletin boards as part of computer history or like computer networking history or something like that. And then you'd look at all these protocols and standards and techniques for connecting computers to one another, exchanging data reliably, error correction, things like that. And then there's a whole different way of looking at the history where you might look at like, underground comics and fanzines and pirate radio and low power FM and like all these communication media. And I like to think that the this book is about like putting those pieces together, that these bulletin board systems exist at this like intersection where computing had become accessible enough that they could become kind of like sit in the same space as like the Xerox machine that enabled fanzine culture to flourish. Um, that the bulletin board system could be seen as like something that you might you might convince people to buy a computer because of a bulletin board. Mm, like they might not yeah. be interested in games or applications or programming, but they are interested in getting on these systems to chat with other folks about whatever their interest is. Mm. And so you see things like um, the the book. Oh shoot, what is it called? The Anarchist Guide to the BBS uh, is this like short paperback book that made the rounds. And what's notable about that book is in, there's a chapter in it that is aimed at an audience who has no computer and, in fact, is pretty skeptical of the computer, which would describe a lot of people who are like self-described uh, anarchists or political activists in the 1980s. Computers would be seen as like tools of the man. They're not like tools of liberation. 
And so the book, the author of the book is like, well, you know, you actually don't need the latest, greatest machine to get onto a bulletin board. In fact, like you're just sending messages to each other. So you should probably just get a monochrome monitor and like a secondhand PC from someone else who's getting a new one, which is just like counterintuitive to an innovation way of looking at it. Like the things people are doing with the computer are super innovative, but you don't even need a new computer to do it. In fact, you can get like an older generation machine and still participate in this like cutting edge social practice. That's very true. That's very true. All right. So um, changing tack just for a moment, then um, just want to talk about uh, you um, and obviously <laughs> what led up. I know <laughs> your favorite topic. <laughs> no, um, but, you know, what what led up to um, you, you writing this book. Um, so um, talk us through it. You, you, you obviously started um, using um, bulletin boards and perhaps other services yourself personally back in the day when these services were the prevalent services. So how, how did you first encounter bulletin boards or other online services? And, uh, you know, tell us a bit about your youth there. What, 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 uh, what journey did you go through? Yeah, it's a great question because part of why I came to doing this research and writing this book was because I kind of expected that this book would already exist and I just hadn't found it yet. Um, and what I, you know, what I came to find through reading a lot of other of other work was like my personal experience of getting online wasn't actually represented very well in the scholarly literature, like the literature that was read by students and folks working in internet studies. And partly it's because the way that I got online was very local. So I grew up in Massachusetts, which is like a state with, a, with which is really small and like densely settled. And there's a lot of people who work in computing there. There's like, it's the home of Route 128, which is like traditionally a technology corridor. And so when, it, when I started to get interested in computers, there was lots of people around who had them. And my first exposure to bulletin board systems was actually through a gaming store that I used to go to for tabletop gaming and role playing games. And the store had was run in part kind of like a membership club where to play the games on the gaming tables or reserve time, you paid a small amount of money to get a membership card. And then they created a bulletin board system to kind of like extend the community that was gathering around the store into this online space. And anybody who was a member automatically got an account on the BBS, but they put a machine out onto the floor of the store. So you didn't even really need to own a computer or have a modem to participate in the online world, which was included a MUD, but was also had messaging and stuff like that. And so my first encounter with bulletin boards was like something you did together with other people at a place. You could see the machine that was hosting the system. We talked about it at school. It was like, Part of, it was totally woven into my local social world. Later, uh, there was a dial-up ISP that got started in my town, and their offices were on Main Street, and they hung up a sign on one of the buildings that said internet and like had an arrow pointing down into an alley. So it was, I mean, obviously that was funny, but it was like, yeah, the internet is there. It's like on Main Street, and you can go talk to the people that are keeping the, the racks of modems lit up. So between these two experiences, it was like the internet is this translocal thing. It's about like you hook on through some local node and then you're going to connect to all these other systems and you could visualize it as this like journey across the world. And that's really different than the vision of the internet as this like universal no nowhere where like you're in, you're just in like cyberspace and everything is one click from everywhere else. That kind of early experience you really felt like, okay, I'm, I'm on this machine and now I'm like using Gopher or Telnet or something. I'm like connecting to this other machine and I'm logging in and I'm like moving mm. through space. I've got a, I've got a, I've had a lot of limitations, but it shaped like my expectations for how the internet ought to work in the future. It's, so, it's something I, I, I've just, it, you've just reminded me of the very first time that I ever used the internet. I went, I, I, I grew up in Scotland and I grew up uh, in Edinburgh and there was a, 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 a cyber cafe called um, Cyberdelia, I remember it. It was so steampunk, it was cool. It was, yes. really cool. so this must've been about 94, 95, something like that. Went in there and I, I, I knew about FTP. I knew I could download Doom from FTP, right? So that was my purpose. But I 
this is this is because I was coming from a BBS world where you had to dial up with a toll call, right? So yes, if I yeah. wanted to dial a BBS in say London from Edinburgh, that was going to cost me a national rate call, very expensive, right? So if I went on the internet, I knew that I had to call up, but I what I didn't get even so when I paid my, you know, I say two two pounds or whatever it is for an hour's worth of use of the internet in this internet cafe, I still thought that because I was going across to the USA to this, um, you know, this public FTP server to download Doom and put it on floppy disks, that I would be incurring a toll call, and 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 like all this time I was think I was just watching all the bytes coming down the internet, and I was like worried that you know any moment somebody was going to come over from the desk in the in the call in the in the cafe and say, hey, you're you're making this really expensive call to the USA. You can't do that, you know. But because that was my BBS mentality, you know, I yes. couldn't just, I knew it was in the USA. I knew, so it was going to cost a lot of money, but that was the whole thing. The internet was decentralized and I hadn't worked that out in my head yet as this, you know, young punk that I was. So, you know, uh, I think that was, that was, I guess, um, that kind of formulated a lot of the difference in mentality with BBSs as well, right? Because you were, you had a localized mentality. And the, the fact that you had to pay for a call, if it was outside of your local area, especially, um, you were going to pay for it. And that kind of meant that there was this kind of local mentality to the bulletin boards, right? Where Whereas yeah. within within the, the, the internet, you know, you paid one call. Uh, that call might have even been free if you'd had a subscription to AOL or something. Like that. I don't know how it worked later on in the US, especially. But, you know, that was the, that was the thing. Um, whereas... You could and you could go anywhere, whereas on a BBS, that was your home place. That was that was yeah. you know your local node, and that's where you hung out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's pretty peculiar to the U.S. though with this flat rate local calling. There's obviously a other places, but like not true through lots of places in Europe. Like all calls were billed in by time, even in some small way, unless you specifically paid for that flat rate local billing but in the u.s it was pretty standard that local calls were free like they were just your monthly bill and then if you called outside your local calling area you paid and most people didn't make very many long distance calls at all and if they did they might call an operator and ask a person how much is this going to cost before they would make the call so yeah bbsing in the u.s was very very local that meant there was a lot of redundancy so like the Doom shareware zip file was probably replicated over like uh, 10,000 bulletin board mm. systems in every area code in, in North America. Um, but it also meant that people identified really strongly with their local BBSs. And it meant that most of the people you met on there were people that you could probably hang out with in real life if you wanted to. So there's a lot of talk. People's memories about bulletin board systems don't actually have that much to do with the computer. They're about like the friendships they made and people they hung out with and going to parties together or, you know, like uh, people having um, going to a bowling alley or like doing stuff together and then having these jokes that like play out online or like games you play together and things like that. So it really is like an extension of your local community. Um, mm -hmm. You know that not to totally over romanticize it because people certainly had uh, lots of awkward and negative experiences with that as well, and many people were happy to be a stranger in a universe of an online space. But one kind of cool thing about it is BBS folks who were thinking a lot about the internet, like people who had a foot in both in the early 1990s, for some of them they could think about the internet as a replacement for the phone, the phone system. So it was like. The BBSs would still be there, but instead of the local part, you'd have this internet infrastructure of some kind where you could connect and then anybody could connect to any bulletin board and you could imagine yourself like visiting distant boards and things like that. And that way of thinking about the online world really kind of got obliterated by the web, which kind of collapses that sense of space and localness. Like when you go to a website, unless they tell you, you don't ever really think about it being hosted in a place. Whereas yeah. the bulletin board system is constantly reminding you, like you're on Kevin's board. Like my name is all over it's, it. It's in, it's not, it's not just Kevin's board. It's in Kevin's bedroom on exactly. you know, a PC or an Amiga somewhere. It's like, 
it's a living, breathing thing. There's only I one of them. He might break into chat like at any time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that I think that part of it is like really critical and, and almost hard to overstate how much that shaped the, ex the whole experience top to bottom, um, mm. that, that localness, whether it was, like you said, in someone's home or in the area code. Um, the other kind of quirky part, and I like went really deep on learning about area codes and the ways that the geography of North America was split up, is that very densely settled areas would have lots and lots of area codes that didn't cover that much space, like that many square miles, whereas huge, sparsely populated states would have one area code. So if you were calling bulletin board systems in like Wyoming, you might be able to call all over the state and it would be local to you. Whereas if you're in Massachusetts, like Western Massachusetts, which is only you know an hour and a half drive away, would cost a dollar a minute or something like that to call. Mm. So there was weird geography that happened around that. So that like would shape all of the islands in the Atlantic from Bermuda down to like Bermuda, USVI, Puerto Rico. Those are all considered one area code, even though there is like days of travel to get from one place to the next. Yeah, on the on the topic. So you you know you obviously you, you mentioned there very briefly about how you know you looked around um, being an academic. You know, so you're, you're working at, at Virginia, um, you, being an academic yourself. You know, I think that's that you're very well qualified to write this book. So you said that you went out and you tried to find a book that covered this prehistory of the internet almost, and and you couldn't find one. And, and, and yes, b books on BBSs exist and books on the early internet exist, but like they were technological guides. They were, uh, you know, how to set up a BBS, how to log on to a BBS. They weren't really talking about the experience of a BBS and they weren't really talking about the experience of the internet either. They were talking about like TCP and Ethernet and things things like that, right? There were a lot of, there was a lot of guides like that. And there was, um, you know, I remember the early days of the internet, that, people would write uh, directories, like yellow pages almost, of the internet. So there'd be web pages saying, hey, go, this is this is a good web page and all the rest. But um, what I would just like to call out is, um, and I'll just hold it up so that um, so the viewer can see this. This here, <laughs> this here at the back of the book, um, there is obviously an appendix, um, but uh, 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 this, this part is just going through the amount of research that you've done, which is an exemplar amount. It was just absolutely fantastic to see how much um, reference material you've managed to collect and the um, the efforts that you must have gone to in order to get that. And it's no, it's not an easy thing because a lot of this information has either been just discarded or it's been scattered all over the internet. Jason Scott, obviously, he runs archive.org and, and the Wayback Machine and all the rest. Uh, uh, it, it, well, it's part of, part, he's part of that organization that, that run it. But um, he's done an awful good job of you know, pulling in the information from those days. And I'm sure you've referred to some of his uh, data in there quite a lot as well. But, but just collating all of that and making sense of it, right? From, you know, you're talking 10,000 line text files here and then just taking a choice phrase out of it right that that and it's that is own it must have taken you an extraordinarily long amount of time so my hat my hat is off to you um you know it's a really really great read i certainly recommend uh, anybody who's in the slightest bit interested not just in the you know the fact that there 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 is this bulletin board thing you know obviously you know people like me and you we've got this kind of um i guess rose tinted view of you know, these bulletin boards from the days when we used to dial them up and that was great. But the reality is that pretty much anybody who's interested in um, anything that's kind of like historical, this is this is a great, great uh, book that will give you an understanding of something which has not been documented in this way at all. It just, it has, it did not exist. So this is a really, really key uh, book. And, and, you know, obviously, my uh, documentary, the, the the Back to the BBS documentary, uh, it, it didn't look at the historical aspect of it so much. I mean, uh, Kev, um, Jason Scott, he did his um, he did his, his, his sort of uh, historic um, 
report on bulletin boards um, and they kind of went up to the point where the internet kind of took over. Mm -hmm. um, what I wanted to do with Back to the BBS, the whole point is it's called Back to the BBS because it's the return to going online with bulletin boards. So I was kind of talking about you know, what is the future for bulletin boards and, and the fact that they still exist today and they've been converted into something which you can access uh, via internet protocols, um, mm -hmm. i.e. Telnet and SSH. So, but, but, you know, and I think that's important too, to, to document that part of it. But what you've done is you haven't, you've just taken this whole experience part and really, really honed in on all of the, the data and pulled it all together. So, uh, you know, absolutely fantastic read. Recommend it to everybody, not just geeks. This is, this is a book for a lot of people out there who are interested in history. Um, and I say to people in the street, you know, I say to people all the time, you know, hey, there was something before the web, you know, and I, I'll say to people, young and old, I'll say there was something before the web. And did you know that the internet itself isn't just the web? And, and sometimes you can see people's minds just going, what, there's more than the web, you know? <laughs> and, um, and, and this is a book that will really open people's eyes. So I, I thoroughly recommend it to, to anyone. So yeah, um, please do go out and read it. Um, and I'll come back to that at the end. But there's a couple of um, uh, questions I just wanted to sort of dovetail from, from there into. Could I tell you, if you're interested, like a little bit of how I thought of the book in conversation with like Jason's work on the documentary and textfiles.com because yeah. yeah yeah that'd be great yeah this might be interesting so yeah so <laughs> it is true there's a lot of footnotes to the book and that's for a good reason one is you know it's my job to show my work but the other is to enable other folks to dig deeper because i feel like in some ways this book is just like mapping out the territory and there's so much more to be told and there we're i just describe it as like a hundred thousand simultaneous experiments in building online community. And so many of those systems remain undocumented. Uh, they are, they haven't been consistently ar archived or explored and they would be really interesting to dig into. So the footnotes hopefully will be like something of a guide for future researchers. But yeah, I am um, super familiar with, with the BBS documentary that, Jason Scott made. And I thought a lot about it, which is like what, what the documentary does, which is so powerful, is that it was made just after the period where dial-up bulletin board systems had really like peaked and, and declined in the United States. And so lots of people were available and the memories they had were still pretty fresh from that time. And since then, you know, Jason has uploaded many of the unedited interviews from the documentary, which are available on the Internet Archive as well. And so I was thinking about it like uh, sometimes historians start their work from collections that become available in libraries or archives. It's like a person donates all their papers to a university archive and the archivists catalog it. And then a researcher comes and writes a book about what's in there. And it was like, what would a book be? where textfiles.com is like the primary archive. And we like think about that resource or some of these how-to books that you were describing where like, could we put together something that's like an archive and what story about the history of the internet would we find there? And how different would it be from the story that focuses mainly on ARPANET, the web, .com bubble, like some of these really highly visible events. So yeah, I, just how you described it, you're really like, bringing me back to how I was thinking about this, this project of like, how does, how is this book going to read to someone who's already watched the documentary? How can mm -hmm. they talk to each other? Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I, I bought the DVD box set when it first came out back in, I think it was 2005. And, you know, I've, you know, having done my research for the documentary that I did, you know, I, I definitely refer to that and text files and a whole bunch of things uh, a whole bunch of times. Um, and I and I did um, liaise with Jason at the beginning of that that venture. Um, got his blessing, thankfully. <laughs> but um, I think um, I think it's it's uh, it's it's not a it's not a um, companion. Uh, the book is actually it, it's 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 it in it it's all, in of its own. And um, I think the 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 BBS documentary is one that um, if you if you have 
a previous history or an experience with BBSs, uh, Jason's documentary is great because it will take you down memory lane. It will really, oh, oh yeah, I remember that. I'll remember that. But it's things that you've experienced, right? For people who have never experienced the bulletin board, watching that would probably send them to sleep, right? And I mean that in the best, <laughs> the best possible way to, sure. to Jason. And I'm sure that a lot of people watching my documentary, if they weren't interested in bulletin boards, they'd fall asleep as well. So, but what this does is this opens up a channel to um, a whole bunch of people who are actually um, want to find out about, just like we 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 look in our you know our history, our American uh, history about our country, right, or, or the, the New Zealand history or, or British history or whatever, right? We're interested in the historical aspects, how something became, and there really isn't uh, a dialogue, um, a story that kind of maps out how bulletin boards came to, came to be in that kind of way that is. Um, approachable to um, your average person in the street that really just wants to know how it all came. So that's that's what your book, in my opinion, that's that's what it does. So that's um, why I, I, you know, yeah. I always try and abstract what I do as much as possible um, from you know the the geek that's inside. Yeah. And think about totally. Think about think about the people in the street and think about well, would this interest them? Was this something that has an interest? And I think sort of. There are various different parts of my documentary, like episode three talks about social media, and this leads me into my next question, but it talks about you know social media and where we're at today, right? The, the, these big conglomerates, there's Google, there's Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. The, the internet and, and social media specifically is controlled by a few, very small number of large corporates, but it wasn't always like that, right? So right. This, this book here talks about you know, what was before all of that. And there's a lot of people out there who just accept the way it is today and because they just don't know about that history. So that history is right in yeah. this book. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a good point to segue on to that then, right? So basically, um, you know, dovetailing from there, we say about what you think about maybe the, the future of the internet might look like. Given, um, you know, there are people out there like you and me and, you know, internet historians, Jason, Scott, of, co of course, and, and a lot of people like that who, if we had a chance to help shape the internet, you know, we could and we could make recommendations. So if, if you had your um, way, I guess, what, what do you think the future of the internet and social media should or could look like? And um, I guess uh, on top of that, how could BBSs, you know, this aging technology, which is still around today, how could that also influence that decision? Yeah, it's a great question. When I so when I think about social media, I think about it in terms of history, which is like, how long has this period been going? Like. This, when we think about the dominance of a small number of platforms or like the total commercialization of social media, it's actually relatively recent. And so it might, we might measure it in 10 years or 15 years or so. But what's notable about that time, say from 2007 or eight till the present, is that that's also the time when most people started going online for fun. And what I mean by that is like, of course, there was the internet and the web before, and of course, it was like mass in terms of its visibility. But for the most part, a large chunk of people, they didn't go online for fun. Like they went online because they had to for work or school or some other reason. But with the kind of like diffusion of smartphones and growing access to 3G and mobile broadband and things like that, lots more people started going online to chat with people and talk about their interests and find love or argue about politics or all the different things that we do. And that experience, that is something that has its roots in dial-up bulletin boards, in getting on CompuServe and AOL and these other spaces. And it has it went mass at the same time as the commercialization of social media. And that's not coincidental. Part of what the social media thing did was lower the barriers of entry so far down. You know, the ways that uh, Silicon Valley folks talk about like reducing friction or something. It's like they want to sign on new users as easily as possible. So they focus so much on that experience of like getting people to sign up and then getting them to stay. 
which is like a totally different logic from the ways that bulletin board system operators thought about it, which is there's a ton of friction to get on a new bulletin board. Usually the first time you called, you couldn't do anything. You could sign up and then you could send a note to the SysOp that was like, yeah, I'd like to stay. <laughs> and then maybe they get around to calling you back or like eventually approving your account or something like that, or maybe not. They'd, maybe you never get to go on. So yeah, there's that's a, that was a really good point actually it's something you totally uh, you forget about these days because a lot of the bulletin boards that are around current days you know you, they just let you on right they don't want you to don't want you to worry about that but back in the day you know if they thought you were a ne'er do well or somebody who wouldn't contribute files to their bulletin board or for a whole multitude of reasons right you might not be accepted as one of the members of a bulletin board right yeah and so that like that's a good example of how there's a really different logic that that structured all of the social interaction that would follow from that initial log on experience and part of that has to do with the commercial model and and how money flows and things like that but partly it has to do with how you value community and so like my a big takeaway for me from this from this research is i was thinking like where are the sysops in commercial social media, like where is the sysop role on a system like TikTok or Instagram or Facebook? Because the sysop is this like really special figure who in most cases they owned the machine that the Bolton board system was running on. As you mentioned, it could be in the room that they sleep in. They could pull the plug at any time. So they had this like total autocratic power to turn it off at any time. They also had to have some control over the software. So they did all the customization. If there was special art, they either got somebody to make it or they made it. Um, and then they were also kind of the arbiter of social conflict. So if there's flame wars going, they could either stoke it and make it <laughs> worse, or they could intervene or kick somebody off or call people on the phone and be like, please stop acting like a jerk on the board because everybody's going to leave. Um, or if they were being a jerk, all the users would run away. They would run the antivirus software. They kind of had this like combination of social and technical expertise. And they stood like somewhere between the role of owner and user because they are typically participating in the system too. Mm. And so they they have like skin in the game. They have accountability. They're, you know, they if they mess up, the users are going to rebel. Or may, they might leave. It's not that hard to create a bulletin board. So if people are really unhappy, they're just going to start their own board and stop calling your board altogether. So there's just like really different dynamics in terms of who holds the power in these different situations so that when conflicts emerge, which they inevitably do when you get people together to do things, to, you know, be in community with one another, um, you had this role of like the sysop and you could appeal to the sysop to deal with problems in different ways. And we just don't really have that. There are moderators some of whom are employed and we and there's amazing research that shows how the commercial moderators are exploited and treated like really low status workers by the the platform owners in contrast to say people working on the software side and then there's the volunteer administrator or the moderator who is you know running the facebook page or moderating the subreddit and things like that and often those people are unpaid so there's this interesting dynamic and they not only are they unpaid, they have no access to like the source code or the machines or anything like that. So I keep imagining like, what would it look like to have a return of the sysop? Like, what would it look like to have a future of social media where there is a sysop role? And, and where do you see that? And one place you would see it is in emerging new communities like Discord spaces look a lot more like bulletin boards. Um, but then you see people experimenting with literally being a sysop the way that you're describing on bulletin boards that are connected to the current day internet and putting their, you know, like getting their hands dirty running Synchronet or like one of these other software packages where you are the sysop and you have all of those same responsibilities that sysops had since 1978. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I'd like to think, um, well, I actually, I'd like to know what your take is on the modern day bulletin board right what um you know there are these bulletin boards so it's almost like there was a period of uh let's say sort of mid to late 80s where bulletin boards just 
took off, skyrocketed, and then they went and then they kept kept going on a similar sort of trajectory until around about 1994 or five or somewhere around then. Then obviously Windows 95 came out, um, modems started to become more prevalent, AOL, Internet Explorer, you know, all these things came around very, very quick succession between 95 to 97, you know, the internet just, just kind of took over and bulletin boards started to trickle off um, into the early noughties. But then um, for some strange reason, and you know, the motivations of sysops out there um, will, will, will vary, I'm sure, but a lot of them are doing it for nostalgic reasons. A lot of them are doing it for, uh, you know, the desire because they aren't a fan of what the social networks are doing right now. You know, they don't like these conglomerates. They don't like the the, the rules that they put in place, they, they don't feel safe or anonymous enough or whatever their reasons may be. So they've started bulletin boards all over again. And they're not using, like you said, you're, they're talking about Synchronet or, yeah. or, or, or Mystic or something like that. These are pieces yeah. of software which have actually been around since like the 90s. Um, and they've been adapted slightly, uh, but not massively. They've been adapted to work on the internet. So you can telnet to them uh, or you can SSH to them. Uh, uh, you don't need a modem anymore. But other than that, the experience by and large is really, really similar to the original authentic BBS experience. It, you know, you still get this archaic ASCII, ASCII graphics or ANSI graphics, um, all of that sort of stuff. The experience is very, very similar to the one that you would have had in the 1980s or early 1990s. So what do you what do you think about that? I mean, you know, does it does it boggle your mind as to why people are doing this thing uh, and why why it's growing? I mean, like there's, there's evidence to suggest that growing. this is growing. So, yeah. so, what do you think about that? It, I mean, it doesn't boggle my mind because I also like call boards. I guess or I connect to them, you know, on my own. So I'm part of it, <laughs> and you know, it's a great question. I mean, I know for myself, I've been interested in post Facebook futures, like post platform futures. And the way that I've been doing that is trying to be more purposive about where I go online and how I spend my time. And it's that's like committing in some ways to being parts of different communities. And I think that the board, the current existing bulletin boards are like a space where people are charting out new futures. They're like experimenting. Some of them are more explicitly retro, like level 29, like the retro battle stations board where you can dial up if you can find a way over traditional phone line and people love to connect from retro hardware and then like post I'm, I'm here from an Epson, whatever, whatever. <laughs> uh, but that's not all the boards. Like you're saying, a lot of the new boards aren't like that. And instead they're almost like this They're like a vision of a parallel internet to me, because when I look at the archival materials from the early nineties and you see sysops first getting internet connections where they're building net systems using like um wildcat and major bbs and these like mega bbs packages that effectively let you be a quasi isp they are imagining something that looks a lot like these where you have all the bulletin board system features without the area codes and the limitations of long distance calling and without the uh limitations of having like one phone line per user so you know, when you can spin up Mystic and then have 64 simultaneous users, that's a kind of realization of a dream that's like a 30-year-old dream. And it is it is interesting to imagine someone like teleporting from 1993 and being like, oh yeah, this is what I thought the internet was going to be like, totally ignoring the web and apps and everything else that's going on. Um, so I think there's that piece of it. But I do think there's an element of it that's like, that's really creative and that is has some continuity with the spirit of like carving out your own space and we see that time and again like people who were uh living in france during the 1980s were building what they called microservers around the periphery of the minitel platform and so there is this like dominant story of the minitel platform as like the the nationally owned online system but then people built systems around the edge that were compatible with the Minitel terminals, but running on home computer systems. And those folks are also having a moment of revival right now, bringing their systems up so that they're accessible 
on the current day internet and talking about what that means. And, and there's a lot of uh, interest around that. It's also similar to, I think, like the indie web movement and ways that people have been reclaiming some of the early like handwritten HTML world or even like gopher revivalists and things like that, where the internet provides over time has provided so many tools for accessible building of like social spaces or information spaces or capacity for self-expression. And those tools linger on, like they are still there for us to play with. And mm. there are many of us here who want to experiment with them. And I think the it, bulletin board system is like a particularly generative set of tools and practices and habits and structures for bringing people together. Is like it's fun to visit other people's systems. Even if I'm like engaged in a thread on DoveNet or whatever, I almost want to read it from two different boards just because you can. Yeah, yeah, you can see the interconnected status of it, and it's exceeding the original dial-up FidoNet yeah, kind of yeah. way of things. It's really uh, it's pervasive. Um, you mentioned their um, internet tools, and whilst it's not quite on the bulletin board side of things, that made me think back to the days of things like GeoCities. Yes. Um, and I think uh, it, it kind of ties in loosely, whereas because um, if, if you remember the initial days of the web you know, and services like GeoCities, you were given so much freedom as you know, fairly uneducated user to write things like basic HTML, to write your own and have your own persona online without limitation. I mean, really, really, if you think about how much freedom you were given on sites like GeoCities and the early forums and just things like that, I mean, they would, they would lock all that down for security reasons these days. But back in those days, there was so much creativity, so many tools that you could do, both on bulletin boards, but then that kind of you know, flopped into the internet um, from those early bulletin boards. There is nothing like GeoCities that I can think of right now, right? And people love that. And people would visit your GeoCities page and some of them were real trash and they would just stay under construction. But then some some people had some spent an inordinate amount of time making really intricate, amazing content. And it was like just, you know, stuff that you, you know, you wouldn't think of. You couldn't, you couldn't, there would be no commercial reason for doing it. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you go on the web today, you know, there's there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's Google, and, and you start to look at it and you start thinking, well, how many non-commercialized websites am I going to? Well, the answer is probably on a daily, on a regular, not that many, right? You're going to things which are set up that work in a very specific way. And although you can write what you want to write on Facebook and you can participate in groups, Facebook have defined the experience so that it works in a very prescriptive way, right? And I think that, I guess, is one of the things which I really miss about I, both the, the early internet and also um, the fact of the BBSs. Every single BBS you would log into, unless they were stock, they would have a different user experience. Yeah. They could be, you know, you'd go in and it'd be like, you know, you know, Wizard of Oz, you'd go down this, you know, road and you'd find yourself in some menu somewhere and, and it'd have all sorts of different things, whether it be door games, whether it be different mods or, or, or whatever. And it, they'd look different. They'd have different screens, anti graphics. Some of them would look real cool. And it was just this experience like none other that, um, that you just don't see today on, on, the, on the modern web. Um, not really anyway. Do you think yeah. that's a fair statement to make? It's something I've really been wrestling with because absolutely like the moment of GeoCities has passed in some ways. Um, I mean, literally the site GeoCities has passed. But at the same time, there are more opportunities for creating new things online that we kind of, for some reason, don't think of them in the same way, like building interactive stories on Twine or like these various spaces where you can put a little bit of JavaScript together and make like a fun app or something like that. Never mind YouTube and TikTok. And these are like creative spaces. They're just, as you described, the political economy that they're wrapped up in is totally different. And in many cases, pretty extractive or exploitative of the, the kind of social activity that happens there. Um, I'm trying to, you know, when I think about it, part of what was so interesting about the homepage moment is that 
even with those limited sets of tools, there's almost like a desire to create BBS-like interactions in them. So people would make like a very rudimentary guest book and that would turn into a messaging system in an almost forum kind of atmosphere would emerge there. And so that has made me think about how time and again, regardless of what the specific features of the system are, people will kind of like will a bulletin board into existence. So you'll even see bulletin board system like interactions happening in the comments on a YouTube video with millions of views where it's like almost impossible to navigate. And yet there'll be like some really touching, like sentimental interaction between two people that takes place in the comments. Mm. So even in these like almost adversarial communication spaces, people will like find a way. And yeah. then it, let, it gives us a chance to like do contrasts with much longer running systems. So I've been spending a lot of time on the well lately. And what's so wild about being on the well is you can sometimes you'll stumble into a thread and you see like the latest messages is like, you know, number 7,000. And then you can scroll back to message one and it's from 1995. And it's like continuous conversation, maybe with gaps of years or something, but it's like people are talking about some topic and they keep coming back to it time and again. That's one of the rare systems where there was a text mode period, and then they built a functional web interface without scrapping the database of messages and user pro profiles. And so there's some people who still connect to the well through uh, SSH, I'm sure, at this point, and then others connect just through the web interface. Web interface but we yeah. don't have that many cases where that happens. Usually there's like a rupture. And so some bulletin board system communities, they like the system ended, and then they moved to the web, or they moved to an email listserv, or in some cases, there were FidoNet echoes that moved to Usenet and things like that. So there are cases of like migration, but we don't have that many like systems that have continuity. And so what I'm really looking for is like continuity. I have a lot of faith that people will be creative and whatever tools are available, we'll adapt them to our needs. But will we have like continuity with the past? That question is not sure to me. Mm -hmm. Indeed. If we're talking about people who maybe have read your book um, or experienced bulletin boards for the very first time mm -hmm. um, and really have no first-hand experience, uh, what what would you say to these people? What would uh, what do you th and then what do you think goes through? Because we we have this predetermined vision of yeah. both the web, the internet and bullet boards, right? And we can never go back and undo that bullet board knowledge. We've got that, yeah. that's yeah. in there. So we can't we can't change. But for the people who are like, you know, I've spoken to people through the, the documentary that I did, who were 16, 17, 18, you know, real young, never heard of bullet board, boards before, but found them through modern services such as Reddit. And oh, and it yeah. just it just blows my mind. So what do you what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean Part of the, the challenge of the book was to kind of convey the feeling of being part of these systems. And that was a challenge for me to get outside of my own head too. Like from my personal experience comes pretty late in the game. And I had no firsthand experience of calling Apple II boards in 1983 or something like that. So there are a whole variety of experiences that we might put together under this umbrella. And actually nobody, could really have wrapped their arms around the totality of what it meant to build these online systems at the time because they were not carefully interconnected the way they would be later. And so you kind of enter into it with this sense of like openness and possibility and kind of like curiosity and exploration and also a tolerance for being confused, I think was another key piece of it. Like you would find yourself on a new system and not know what was going on, why people were there, what they were talking about. And you just kind of lurk around a little bit and then mosey on to the next thing. These systems generally weren't like self-describing because again, like we're so accustomed to Silicon Valley logic, which is very focused on the new user, get people signed on as quickly as they can and get them to start posting or whatever. This is a different orientation that's about like long-term interactions with groups of people. Um, so yeah, I think that like being a little comfortable with things being confusing would, would be an important characteristic that's easily forgotten.
Yeah, it is. I mean, certainly it, um, it's a sort of almost like a bar of entry, isn't it? Because when you log into your a bulletin board for the first time, um, you know, I, I can't remember exactly what the experience was like, but, you know, I was fiddling with, you know, ANSI, you know, switch it because I'm pretty sure it was probably like Windows 3.1 and I was yeah. running Hyper Terminal on my 14.4K <laughs> modem and, you know, I didn't have ANSI and Hyper Terminal was a terrible, terrible term. A terminal client and and it just displayed everything wrong and i was like why the heck is like you know when i type it go, it's over there on the right hand side and like dancy graphics wasn't coming up right and you know everything was horrible and then you'd speak to somebody and they would say hey you know don't do that use use proper terminal program like telex and dos or terminate or something like that right so there's all these sorts of learning experiences and you know by and large um you know it's, it's a little bit better but it's not it's not orders of magnitude that you would kind of like you just go into a web page like facebook and click you know a new user the experience is still a bit more uh hardcore and i've tried to make my bbs i've got a bbs myself and i've tried to make that as user friendly because i'm thinking about people who are coming from the web never having experienced the built board but even then i'm like there's certain elements of that i just can't get out of i can't get away from it as a bullet board it's not the web and therefore, yeah. you know, you have to choose your code page when you log in. And, and you know, I know that some people are going to go, what the heck is a code page? Exactly. You know, like, what, you know, so there's all these things. And so that creates a barrier to entry immediately. And you have to yeah. download a terminal client and you have all these sorts of things. So you really got to have to want to do it in order to get on in the first place. But, you know, I think uh, the interesting thing is that the reward after that effort, you know, there is, you know, a good if a good reward after it so um it, it's, a, it's a really interesting um sort of journey so um, yeah, I, mean, I mean the reward in some part is that for many media systems when they pass their prime or something like that the audiences had no control over them so if you were unhappy about how like the experience of going to the cinema has changed over the last hundred years for the most part you can't like go back to a Nickelodeon or something like that. Whereas in these cases, through the efforts mainly of hobbyists and enthusiasts and volunteers, we can like recreate in some limited sense what the these past experiences would be like. And that's a pretty profound difference from other areas of media history where we might even have like some of the artifacts or some of the machines, but they're, they don't work. Like the networks are gone or something has decayed or like films are just turning into dust and catching on fire in their canisters and things like that. And it's, it's pretty unusual. And this is like a huge benefit to me in teaching about these topics. So in my undergrad courses, one of my courses here is comparative histories of the internet. And when we read about Gopher, we can go on a Gopher page in class. Or when we read about bulletin boards, we can go out and connect to live bulletin boards that really exist. When we read about GeoCities, we can look at archived GeoCities pages. And that's an amazing experience that is distributed to everybody who has access to the public web. Mm. And and uh, yeah, and but it is um, out there as a result of just a fair few people, right? This is not something that's you know automatically done there are there are people out there custodians of the internet good people like jason scott for example who are taking the effort to go a long long way into pulling this data i mean it like people scanning manuals yes. uh, you know downloading text files uh you know making software work with modern protocols on the internet and stuff like that all sorts of different ways to make these experiences relivable now and so you know again my hat goes off to these people because you know it's a lot of effort in order to do that to keep these things still alive and have the experience but um but it's out there and that and that's great that you know your students are able to experience that that's uh that's a really cool thing i didn't i didn't know that that you did that. yeah so that's, that's yeah really cool i mean to put like a fine point on it the book couldn't exist without all of that work that was done over years by, as you put it, like a relatively small number of people who took it on themselves to keep these materials accessible or create very niche software tools to be able to translate old file formats and things like that. And it's just like the, these contributions can have long lasting impacts that may not even be immediately apparent to the people who did them. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, Kevin, unless you've got anything else for me, I think um, I've taken 
well, I mean, I could go and talk to you for for days and days and days about all this stuff. <laughs> but uh, I better let you get back, get get to your bed. I mean, it's probably getting yeah. quite late where you are. <laughs> we survived so, a massive thunderstorm that was making yeah. make, like emergency messages on my phone pop up. So kudos to us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, look, Kevin, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I really have enjoyed um, speaking with you. Um, uh, just uh, just as a reminder, the book is called The Modem World. It is available. Where can, where can you get the book, actually? That's a good point. Where can you? There's a number of places that you can get the book um, online and so forth. Where, where can you yeah, get it? So the, the easiest thing to shout out is the website modem.world, which is a simple domain, but it will always point to places where you can access the book. Awesome. All right. Well, that's it. That's great. Um, keep in touch. Um, I'd love to love to hear about what you get up to in, and uh, keep the the uh, the bulletin board and the prehistory of the internet and social media alive. How you how you keep going through that venture. So I uh, wish you the very best with that. But in the, in the meantime, take care and all the best. Thank you. Yes. Thanks so Cheers. much for having me on.